Hello everyone and welcome. Yeah, we should be live at the moment. Let's have a look and see that we are streaming live. And yes, we are live. <laughs> hey guys, uh, it's been a while. It's good to see you all again. It's good to be streaming again. Um, and I'm here today with a very special guest, of course. Everyone loves him. It's the Thunderous One. So hi, Thunderous. Hey everybody. Hey Lloyd. Um, it's been a while. Um, Thank you for inviting me back on the show. It's great to be with you. And uh, look, everybody, the band's back together. Yeah. Hey, guys, just audio check. Do let me know that uh, Thunderous's audio is coming through correctly. Right, just, just drop a one in the comment if everything is good. Good morning, Zahar. Ex excellent. Thanks, DHC. Much appreciated, Casey. All right, that's good to know. I haven't done this in a while, so... <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Much appreciated. Okay, yeah. So, uh, guys, today we're going to do two things. We'll run for about 45 minutes because, guys, it's football night. It is a match on. So, you know, some things, some things are very, very important. Um, yeah, Zahar, I am also glad to be back on the channel. I've been neglecting the channel because I've been on everyone else's channels. Um, that said, I will be on Nuria Khan's channel, The Holy Humanist, um, tomorrow. We'll be discussing uh, Sharia law again. And I mean, she, she's a fantastic interviewer. She knows the subject really well. She asks great questions. And yeah, so Anna MC, Casey, um, Sergeant Grinch, got your crayons. I see everyone's got their pen and paper and crayons ready. XYZ, thank you for being here. Ken Johnston. Um, there's a guy called Thunderous One in the comments. Probably, a, probably the, could be a fake Thunderous One because I know he's talking to me. Don't know how you can <laughs> type and speak at the same time. And... Uh, yeah, let me just change that. Okay, guys, yeah, so good to see you all. Built for Speed just arrived. Seraph just arrived. Welcome. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but but I've I've had frustrations working with Jay, and I, I don't want to continue on the channel. I think I've made my point. And, um, but yeah, that's that's a longer story for another day. So I would prefer to, to just focus on my channel and other smaller channels. The wood is getting out. Things are building. By the way, I did record 14 episodes with, um, uh, thank you, Anne Leuchter. I appreciate it. She saw us in nearest channel, says we're a great team. Uh, yeah, so I did 14 episodes recorded with Al Fadi four months ago. Uh, when he's going to release them, who knows? Okay, yeah, so uh, Thunderous, any comments from you before we dive in? No, um, well, it's great to have you back on your own channel, Lloyd. It's great to have your audience uh, loyal to you. It's, um, you've obviously had a wonderful experience going speaking to Jay and um, uh, Al Fadi. Um, hopefully, what's happened there will reflect in uh, your channel as well. And certainly, um, I'm sure every member of um, your subscribers has been going to Lloyd and uh, sorry, not not to Lloyd, um, to Jay, listening to you there, and um, you know to hear you on these channels is uh isn't it is, is a wonderful blessing for us to see to see you get that kind of exposure exposure i think we'll all agree that you deserve because you're coming up with real material original material um uh, not just repetitive same old uh, material regurgitated over and over again um so yeah absolutely excellent wonderful privilege for you appreciate it thank you and of course guys as you know uh, thunderous is very knowledgeable as well in his own field he always asks very good questions has very good insights approaches the material from Islam in a, an interesting fashion and of course um, yeah very good with atheism which is actually something I've been looking at very closely recently as well and I've got some interesting research again I, I tend not to come up with the same thing everyone else does so. uh, but you might be surprised uh, once once you start putting together the package on atheism uh, atheist governments atheist ideologies right atheism in government has been the most prolific genocidal political ideology of the last 250 years with the exception of islam over the last 1400 years in the last 250 years atheists have murdered more people than any other ideology religion government system you name it combined atheism is is the is the number one big time oscar winning gold star most murderous government ideology of the last two and a half centuries and yeah we'll we'll talk about that another time okay yeah so so guys hey Daduza, welcome sergeant grinch thanks okay so let's jump in so we shall go here and there we are so i'm going to talk i'm going to continue basically where i left off on uh, jay's channel so we'll just continue here um yeah so we're going to talk about rules, regulations, and legalistic thinking. And Thunderous, if you have any comments, just jump in. 
I will do. I'm also monitoring the questions as well. So if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask, throw them in the uh, live chat and then I'll uh, make mention of them to Lloyd. You know, Michael Petek says, if a person were to substitute the Jewish Shema for the first article of the Shahada, would the Shahada be Islamically valid? You know, something you need to ask Muslims, because they for decades have been saying the following, we worship the same God. Okay? Now, if we do worship the same God, tell them, okay, then please say the Shahada in the name of Yahweh. Please say the Bismillah in the name of Yahweh. When it's Eid, I'd love to hear you slaughter your animal in the name of Yahweh. Say the prayers to Yahweh. It's the same God, right? It absolutely, positively will not happen. Because Allah is not Yahweh. They know this. We know this. But this is one great way to force them into a corner, paint them into a corner. They've made a lot of claims that are not true, and they will not. What are your thoughts on that, Andrew? No, I think I think right from the very get-go, anybody with any sense of intelligence um, or even entry-level intelligence will clearly see that when you look in the difference between, say, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you can see a parallel between Judaism and Christianity. It, it is the same God. The scriptures between the um, Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures are a tapestry that are interwoven with each other. They go back and forth. The Quran is clearly from another mindset, another source, another God. They are not related, not remotely, not in the slightest. Yeah, that is very, very true. Um, actually, I want to see someone mentioned something. I want to bring this. You guys can see this, right? Uh, close your eyes if there are kids in the house. Right. So here we are. You guys can see this. Um, now, this guy is really... So remember, Islam speaks of having an oral tradition. Uh, this, I think, is Islam's uh, oral tradition right here. No, right. <laughs> So this is gross. So guys, this is uh, pure monotheism. They do not worship pagan stone gods. They don't worship a rock. They don't pray towards it, bow towards it, lick it, and kiss it. Um, except that they do. Um, the pagan Arabs did this. But this, you see, he's praying to a black stone. He is licking a black stone. These guys are venerating and worshipping a stone. This Can is... I... Yeah? No, I was just going to say that when you consider that Jesus says he was the cornerstone, so Jesus was... Um, in the figurative sense, not in the literal, it was in the yes. figurative sense, the cornerstone of our faith. Yet you look at Islam, Satan has clearly manipulated the understanding of uh, linguistics and uh, um, etymology and he's made a stone, the literal cornerstone, whereas Jesus in the Bible is the cornerstone of faith. So you can see how Satan's cleverly grafted something on, but with a twist of his own. They say it's not uh, idolatry, but you'd have to be yet again stupidly perverse or hopelessly ignorant to not see that is not idolatry. When you bow it down to it 35 times a, uh, a week, you know, some 140 times a month, at what point is it not idolatry? Yeah. Yeah. No, so so this is this is an idol. I mean, this is this is a stone. They worship. This is worship of a stone. He's praying to it, right? This is Allah. So yeah, this is pretty gross. I'll just close that out there. Um, yeah. So I'll try and do the questions, but also need to get through the material. So let me pick this up, and we'll continue from there. So Islam is about rules, regulations, and legalistic thinking, right? So the word shari means clearly defined way. It also means main road, highway, main road at the side of a road. So it's a road, okay? However, the context that we have for this within the law is it means lawgiver. So understand, you will find colloquial definitions, right? They'll say jihad means struggle. Yes, it does. It actually does. However, the shari definition, the legal definition means warfare to enforce Islam on the non-believers, right? So notice here, the shari definition is lawgiver. Muhammad, in his function as a role model, an exemplar of the law. The exemplar means the perfect example. And of course, in Islam, he is the lawgiver, which is within the Sharia, synonymous with Allah. In other words, they are equal. This is, of course, shirk. But that's fine. It's Islam. It doesn't make sense. Sharia, yes? I was going to ask, um, if Muhammad was the walking Sharia, um, at what time was it finished as a, a written compilation as far as history is concerned? Uh, the Sharia took about eight to nine hundred years to complete. So you're looking at from, let's say, the middle of the eighth century you had the early outlines. The ninth century it really kicked into high gear. 
much of it was done by the early 12th century, by the early 1100s, and it, to be honest, was only capped off and finished in the 1500s. Why, why, if you don't mind me asking this, so mosaic, the Mosaic Law came with Moses, and they had evidence of that because um, Moses had the miracles to prove that he was a prophet. Now, that didn't take long to compile. Then you have the Law of Christ. They were written down and compiled within the lifetime of the said prophets. Why was the Sharia not written down in the lifetime of Muhammad? Because What's it the was... As the, as the empire grew, they needed to set a series of regulations, they needed to set a series of laws and cultural concepts, cultural ideas that they could, could adhere around to form a single uni Okay, I'll turn mine louder. Um, a single unified set of cultural ideas that they could all form a culture around, form a nation around this ummah. Okay, so I have set mine much louder, it's at maximum on the software. Let me know if the, the mic is better. I'll bring the microphone closer to my face as well. Right. And yes, but it took it took 900 years more or less. So yeah, they, it evolved over time. And the interesting thing is because of the sheer amount of documentation of the Sharia, because it's so much written material, you can easily trace it. You don't have to speculate. You can read the books. Okay. Right. Okay. So Sharia means a prophetic religion in its totality. So within Muslim discourse, the rules and regulations governing the lives of Muslims. Notice this is political. This is not religious. And they mean here Islamic jurisprudence. So it is political as well as legal. So notice this designates, okay, Sharia designates a way or path divinely appointed. So this is the law of Allah, right? So this is a legal religious system, a political religious system. It's, we don't have this concept within Western law, within Western culture. Right, so there are two purposes of the law. So Islam deals with two broad aspects of regulation, right? This is political regulation. This is civil law. This is not moral law, like Christianity has moral law. It doesn't have a civil legal system, right? Laws dealing with man's duty to Allah called ibadat and the five pillars of Islam. Uh, in some, I've no, I have found one reference at least to the five pillars of Islam. Zakat was added, this almsgiving was added very late, and this was previously jihad. So zakat replaced jihad. Uh, Sharia completion date. So the, 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 the cherry on the cake, um, Ian, we're looking at a guy called Shar'ani. He wrote a book called the Mizan al Kubra, because by then you had, the, had this, this huge plethora of Islamic schools right this huge number of islamic schools and they were eventually whittled down to four they, they tended to kill off the others right and so you then had the four schools right who were chosen because they were the most persuasive right so they chose shafi hanbali maliki and um, hanafi right and so you had differences between the schools called ikhtilaf and they had to harmonize these differences and that process was completed when a scholar called Shar'ani wrote a book called the Mizan al-Kubra, the, the Kubra, the Great Balance of the Supreme Scales, which, which gave them a doctrine which allowed them to harmonize the differences between the four schools. Remember, the differences are minor. The differences are like 20%. They are equal and the same on like 80% of the doctrine. The differences are minor. They don't affect the doctrine. The, the differences are like simple things like, do you hands, hold your hands up here when you pray or hold them down by your navel? That doesn't affect anything in the doctrine. That's cosmetic. So you're looking at, I think, the early 15th century. If I look, just look up Shar'ani, the Mazan al-Kubra, and um, the Great Balance or Supreme Scales. And you, once you have that date, that, that more or less caps off um, the development. It's probably the 14th, 15th century, so 1400s. It's probably in the 1400s that you find that that, that kind of finishes. Okay, can I ask a question? Yep. There are 72 sects in Islam as prophesied by Muhammad. How many of them hold the Sharia as their um, foundation then as far as law is concerned? So, so this is a discussion that I've had with people um, who don't really understand. So for instance, people say, well, I won't mention names, but, but I have had people sort of say that, well, maybe 1% of Muslims follow the Sharia. And this is not true because for, for instance, okay, let me, uh, so I'm going to try and answer this in a, in a detailed fashion. Okay, let's go. So, do only 1% of Muslims have funerals, get married? Do only 1% of Muslims pray? Do only 1% of Muslims pay zakat? Okay? Do only 1% of Muslims do the things that Muslims do, like go to the mosque on Friday? Do only 1% of Muslims have divorces? Because, you see, if you go into the Quran and you look for 
you look for the the interesting parts you know like you say okay how do i conduct a wedding how do i do the hajj what is the procedure what do i wear where are all the rules how do i follow this procedure right none of that's in the quran all of it is in the sharia so you go here sacred knowledge the nature of legal rulings okay purification how to do the purification how to do prayer here we've got 200 well 120 pages on prayer then you got the funeral prayer 24 pages on the funeral prayer zakat you've got 33 pages fasting you have 20 pages now there there isn't 20 pages on rules of fasting and zakat in the quran so notice the pilgrimage trade inheritance marriage divorce the quran does not have this it'll mention yeah get married but the marriage rules notice here that's 50 pages right so divorce is another 24 pages so if only 1% of Muslims follow the Sharia, then I guess no Muslims are doing any of these Islamic things. See, all Muslims, everything in Islam is in the Sharia. It's explained. The rules are all in the Sharia. 100% of them follow the Sharia, whether they know it or not, whether they admit it or not, whether they like it or not. So hopefully that answers. Does that answer the question? Uh, I was just wondering if there's 72 sects, I hear, I hear what you're saying. So that, that would imply that the 72 sects take the... the this Sharia as their mainstay, and it is only the theological doctrines that splinter from that. For instance, um, the Sunni and the Shia, would they take this, both of them, as the Sharia, or does the Shia have their own? It's similar uh, enough. I mean, look, it's similar enough, to be quite honest. The, the Sunnis, Al Asad University recognizes the Jafari school of jurisprudence from, uh, from Shia Islam. Let's have a quick look at marriage, the book of marriage, okay? Let's look at just the index, okay? These are all the rules. Who should marry? Who should not marry? When you should marry? Look at all this, okay? Blah, blah. This is just, let's have a look at this index. That's page one. These are all the rules, right? Remember, there's 120 pages of this, right? These are all the chapter headings, all the chapter headings, subheadings, subchapters, chapter, subchapter, all of this stuff, okay? Um, there's, there's two and a half pages, three pages. Okay, three. Yeah, there's three pages, just the index, right? So there's a lot of detail here that is not found in the Quran. It's not found in the Hadith. They all follow this. They all get married. They all follow the same rules. Yeah. Interesting. The, the, the uh, Bob Fisher makes a comment. He says, uh, "Sounds like a cult. So many guidelines." And that's pretty much. Would you say that that's pretty much the same way that we see a modern cult today, where the followers of the charismatic leader can't seem to do anything without consulting the charismatic leader first as to what's right or wrong, good and bad, left or right. Yeah, it's a religion of law. I mean, it's 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 when Jesus criticized the Pharisees, he stated, "You have made this a dead religion." Just yes. with man-made rules, and this is this is precisely. Don't forget the imams of Islam are the Pharisees of Islam, right? They're, they're the Pharisees of Islam. That's exactly what this became. Exactly that was when Jesus said he teach the commands of men as do, as doctrines. Uh, yeah. So, Sergeant Grinch, are we wasting time with the Quran? Look, as I've as I've said to, and I'm not certain. I'm not sure that this episode will be aired. There's still one episode that's due to come out. But basically, I said. The Quran and Hadith are kindergarten level Islam. And people are saying, wow, thank you, I'm Leuchter. I'm really appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Right? The Quran and Hadith are kindergarten level Islam. So what you have is Muslims, lay Muslims are only allowed to know the Quran and some Hadith. Right? Now, we are then saying, well, well, th these are kindergartners. They only know kindergarten books. We must approach them as kindergartners with the same knowledge and then argue with them about what these kindergarten books mean. So you have kindergartners arguing with kindergartners about the meaning of kindergarten level books. However, when you go to, when you send your kid to kindergarten, he doesn't get taught by a three-year-old. He doesn't get taught by a kindergartner. He gets taught by someone with a degree from university. The person with a degree from university understands the kindergarten level stuff at a vastly greater level than the child, than the kindergartner. Right? We need to come from the level of the PhD, of the master's degree, of the degree, and then you understand this other material. Understand? So, so this is, this is what, what we need to do. And knowing the Quran doesn't mean you know Islam. It means you know the Quran. Knowing the Hadith doesn't mean you know Islam. It means you know the Hadith. Uh, Thunders, your thoughts? <clears throat> I, I was just thinking to myself that um, the way you were describing it there, it, it's very akin to the legal system in America or England that I know, or even the medical system where you have layers of um, 
if you like. Um, I wouldn't use the term in law or uh, the medical profession as hierarchy, but you certainly have levels of understanding of discipline mm -hmm. uh, and experience. So it seems to me that um, you have the ground roots level Muslim who then appeals to the local imam. The mo local imam probably appeals to some kind of scholar. The scholar then appeals to some kind of sheikh. The sheikh then goes to somebody above him. And the, the further up you, you go, you find that you're, there are in the upper echelons is where the real knowledge is. And as an ex-Muslim myself that's been brought up in this, I can certainly say that um, categorically that uh, the material that you're doing is, is bang on points because it's reminiscent of, um, but if you, if you consider them like Saudi Arabia as the epicenter, um, and it sends out waves. The further away you get from um, the epicenter, the, the less of the shock waves are. It's in the same sense of the hierarchy. The further, the closer you get to Saudi Arabia, the more of this that you're talking about, Lloyd, is evident in the daily lives of Muslims in the Muslim epicenter. But you don't mm. necessarily discern it as much living in the Western world. But the material that you're discussing is bang on point with what happens if we were living in a Muslim state this will be the, the, the material that will be discussed at the at local level. Yeah, we'll get to, I'll try and get, let me try and get to that within the time that we've set aside for this. Sorry. So yeah, so there are laws dealing with duty to Allah. Everything is transactional in Islam, right? So then all of this stuff, the five pillars, for instance, are generally dealt with first in the fiqh books, right? They're these basic fundamentals. Then there are laws governing human relations called mu'amalat, which everything in Islam is transactional. It's like, think of it as a commercial transaction. Right? When you make a sale and you pay for things, it's commercial. Marriage and divorce and commerce are all lumped into the same conceptual framework. It's transactional. I give you something, you give me something. Give me a little bit of money, you give me a little bit of that. Right? So, and yes, Zakhar, Sharia is the essence of Islam. Right? Yeah. So, now, so ibadat means submissive obedience to a master. This is ibadat, duty to Allah. They, they use lovely euphemisms duty to Allah no it means submissive obedience don't talk back just do as you're told and therefore it is religious practice so religious practice in Islam is to be submissive dutifully submissive to your master and in law it's the ritual of Muslim law so it is simply acts that you follow rituals that you follow rules that you obey stuff you do like the Pharisees again acts which bring the creature into contact with his creator okay so now notice submissive is an adjective and it means allowing yourself or willing to be controlled allowing yourself to be controlled willing to be controlled slave correct bob fisher yes inclined or ready to submit to yield to the authority of another unresistingly obedient that's the dictionary definition of submissive none of these are positive definitions that means basically slave yes uh, thunders yeah, I was going to say, so by implication, then, if that's the adjective in Islam, then then to say maybe not follow that, to, to challenge it, to question it, would be seen as an act of rebellion by implication? Yes, 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 correct. Yeah, so I'll briefly, I've run through this multiple times and run through this quickly, right? I'll try not to harp on this a lot. But Islam is a political system. It is also a legal system, right? It's not a religion. So let's look at this. Islam is a deen, this word deen. Islam calls itself a deen. It is, doesn't call itself a religion. It doesn't mean the same thing as we use. So deen has perspectives on existence, on life, society, and it is a socio-political system. It is a complete and competing ideology, like Marxism is a complete and competing ideology that, that, that challenges the West and wants to replace it, right? It's a system of life and a system of society, right? It's a political framework for managing mankind's affairs, and they mean globally, right? Now, the linguistic meaning of deen can be found in the famous classical Arabic dictionaries, the Al-Qamus Al-Muhit, which was the foundation for Lane's lexicon, which is a very famous academic work, and the Lisan al-Arab, the most famous Arabic dictionary, and this is 20 volumes, and they state that there are four meanings of deen, subjugation and dominance, which includes ownership, right, commerce. <clears throat> Look at the first ones, to subjugate and to dominate. Then ownership, government, political, administrative, legal and administrative, or legislative authority. Wow, Nicholas Paulson, thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. Oh, great stuff. <laughs> yeah, I should make Roybos the official drink of this YouTube channel since it's the other good thing coming out of South Africa. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, so legislative authority. So this is legal and political. Two, obedience and bondage, right? From the famous Islamic dictionaries, this is how they define deen. It is subordination and dominance under the power of others. That's so polite when they say others, they mean Muslims, right? Then you have rules and regulations, doctrine, ideology, tradition, and notice 
or religion, not and or maybe it's an option, it's a possibility, it's not a definite. And then finally, reward and repayment, justice and accountability. Uh, Thunderous? I was just going to say that it seems to me that the, the whole point of Sharia is to create a fear factor. Um, and the fear is uh, a precursor to protecting it. So you create the fear and the fear is the barrier to the protection of it. Would you agree? Yeah, no, it's definitely based on fear. I mean, there is certainly fear. So notice the first meaning is subjugation. Or, now, what's interesting is this article that was on the web was deleted shortly after I made a video on it. <laughs> My first video discussing it, the article disappeared off the web. That said, I'd copied the article, I'd copied the, the, the content, and someone else has a, has a very similar, most of the same thing in a, in a forum posting, and they haven't removed that one. So that one still can be found. So the first meaning is subjugation or dominance, administrative or legislative authority to put pressure to be obedient, to force you to be obedient, using power to enslave or to make one obedient. So using political power, your force to enslave. Okay, I subjugated them. So they obeyed me, right? I ruled or governed upon him. This is not religious. This is entirely political. This is making slaves. The word dying is used to indicate a person who dominates and rules over a state. Again, political. This is a political ruler. And the second meaning is obedience and bondage, subordination and domination by someone, Muslims and bearing humiliation under subjugation power of others. Well, you have to have to humiliate the dhimmis. If we do dhimmi law, you'll see how filthy the dhimmi law is. It is violent. It is abusive. The obedient tribe is called Kamun Da'inun, and here Deen does not mean religion. It means obedience. Understand, they're not discussing religion here. So let's put this in a list. Islam is a Deen. We say Islam is a religion. Well, then you are here. It's 10th on this list and you're ignoring all of the rest on the list. From ownership, government, administrative, legal authority, subordination, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll skip forward here. Notice though, there are Hebrew Jewish origins to this word. Deen means law in Hebrew. Islam claims to be the Deen al haq meaning the truth or right. Conversely, Christianity and Judaism are then are the Deen al batl which means the false religions, the void, the worthless, the abrogated religions. And also, these are the religions of Satan because battle is a name of Satan. Therefore, Jesus is an emissary of Satan in Islamic doctrine. And Deen is the same word as the Jewish word Hok, statutes. Deen ul Hak, Hok, statutes. This is the religion of the law, statutes, legislation. Understand, it's not, it's not a personal relationship. It's follow this list of rules in the book. Thunderous. No, you just got it there. You took the words right out of mouth. This is a religion, not a relationship with God. Yeah, this is a legal system. It's just, it's legal. It's a political I've legal also, system. Yeah. I've also noticed as well that um, on, on the list, Islam is a deed. Religion becomes that. So in effect, the, the religious side, the theocratic side of the uh, the Islamic um, faith is 10th is on the list. It kind of like it's reminiscent of when you could insult Allah, but you can't just, um, insult Muhammad. So Muhammad is above Allah in that sense, when we see that throughout the of world. Course. And in the same sense, the law is above Allah as well. What role does Allah have, have to play in any of this? He, he doesn't well, seem to well, get much of a mention. Yeah, exactly. So the unsheathed sword against the one who insults the messenger. We've seen this before, so guys. Um, notice here, this, this says here, here are the contents of this book. Whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. Killing is prescribed on one who insults the prophet. It is not permissible to imprison him or show him favor or ransom him. Any non-Muslim or Muslim who insults the prophet is to be killed and repentance is not sought. Fascinating stuff. The contents of this book concern the Islamic ruling upon those who insult the prophet. Remember, to insult Muhammad means that you do not believe that Muhammad is perfect. Okay, Muhammad must be regarded as perfect. And to believe that Muhammad is imperfect is insult. So anything that says anything other than no is perfect is the death penalty in Islam. But um, but the logic, logic is as well, uh, as the phrase goes in the world, actions speak louder than the words. So if that's a verbal attack on Muhammad or a criticism or even sometimes even questioning can be an act of kufr, um, why then is it, um, or what is the standard against those who refuse to accept Islam but don't give a verbal response as to why they don't? Um, because the, by, but that by implication is if you don't accept Islam, you are basically with your actions implying that Muhammad is not a prophet. Yeah, I think at some point they want to hear you say it. 
So the, you're forced to say it. Whether you believe it or not, that's between you and yeah. Allah, but they want to hear you say it. They want to hear your submission. Yeah, so it's either one or the other. So you're dead either way then. Yeah, I think so. Look, I mean, it's, look, this is done in stages. And also, once they've made enough examples, they don't have to kill everybody. And not all of them are required to do this. Remember, there's a there's a group that is going to be doing this that will be that will obligate themselves to do this. But, but yeah, I mean, there's rules governing all of that too. But yeah. But they, they don't want to give, give everyone because with the dimmy they get the financial contribution. They don't want to Correct. lose their. And that's um, why they collapsed uh, as well. Yeah. yeah. So Islam again, we've covered this before. Islam has two divisions and four levels. Okay, the two divisions are the Sharia, right? That's your first division, which is the legislative side of Islam. Sharia means to obey Allah. And these are the rules, right? The legislation. It is the Zahir. It is the outer, the exoteric side of Islam. It's the public face of Islam, right? Outer meaning outer practice, public practice, what you see, right? What is the visible, the obvious, right? And then it is the first and the plain level of meaning. The second layer is called the Hakika, right? The knowledge. Technically, the Gnosis, right? It is the spiritual side. Technic well, call it the occult side of Islam, right? Which is barely known in the West. Barely, barely known, Okay. It is known as the Hakika, which means to know Allah, right? And this is also how you commune with Allah. It's how you achieve communion, how you connect your spirit directly to Allah by entering into his throne room and seeing his entering into Allah's presence, right? It is the button, the inner, the esoteric, and it's the gnosis of Allah, right? Then you have four levels, right? You have Ibara, which is the literal understanding of the Quran and the Hadith, right? The Zahid, the external, which is termed that book I spoke of earlier, the, the Mizan al-Kubra, the final book that was written, Right, at least the, the the final doctrine of Islam, this uh, which which the doctrine called Ikhtilaf, the difference which reconciled that, that calls the lowest level of Islam, the Quran and Hadith is the Ibarra level. It's known as Islam for the masses. Okay, Islam for the masses. That's what it is called. Okay, and you are simply just this is the rules for the legislative subjects. So this is Islam for legislative subjects. Then you have the ishara for the imams, the implied, the allusion. This is a higher level understanding of Islam, not taught to lay Muslims. This is for legislative practitioners. Imams are lawyers. They are not priests. They're administrators. They are legal administrators. They are not priests. Okay, Lawyers, not priests. Then your Sufis are your highest level in Islam because they have both the Sharia and they have the Akika knowledge. These are your spiritual practitioners, Lataif and Hakaik. Right. Notice Lataif is the plural of Latifa. Latifa is the Arabic equivalent of the Sophia, sophistry, but also the Gnostic knowledge, Gnostic wisdom. Understand? And Lataif is also very much linked to something called, and I spoke about this on Nuria's channel. Um, the Lataif, okay. So, so Latifa, Lataif is the plural of Latifa. Latifa is linked to and also known as the Laylat. The Laylat, you would happen to know as Lilith. Who's heard of Lilith? Thunderous. No, I haven't. I, when you mentioned Latifa, the only thing I was thinking of was um, Queen Latifa of the early 90s hip-hop. Sorry. So Lilith is according to the Apocrypha, of the, well, the Jewish Apocrypha, right? Jewish Apocryphal texts. She is a demon goddess, apparently the first wife of Adam who defied God. She refused to bow down and she started to eat babies. She killed babies. She's Adam's supposed first wife. And she was, she eventually fled the Garden of Eden. God sent two angels after her to bring her back and she refused. Uh, there's a long story there, so I'm not going to get into that. But understand, and she was banished. She was banished to the deserts. She was banished to the caves and the high places. Can you put two and two together there, Thunderous? Uh, I'm, I'm just taking it saying where, where did this story come from the Jewish uh, the Jewish legends the Jewish um, it's within the Talmud I believe it's, it's, but it's within the Jewish legends my word unbelievable so she was banished so hold on put two and two together here. she was banished to the deserts to the dry places and the caves to the high places and caves yeah, so the implication is, I think, so the scriptures brought it out there. She's the one who strangled Muhammad in the cave. I, I would probably concur that. But um, what I'm trying to reconcile there, though, is in Islamic parlance, they have it as the angel Gabriel. So how did they reconcile the name? When has Islam gotten anything right? Yeah. Right. So understand, she is, I think when you have a sex demon, I think they call it a succubus, 
So these seizures that Mo had potentially, look, I mean, th th don't quote me on this, okay? This is something I read three years ago. I haven't looked through the notes again since then. But if she's a sex demon, then she was using Mo for that purpose. And this would explain why he is such a sex maniac. Okay, and, she's, probably, and if I probably mentioning the name, the, um, the angel, Gabriel's name was a way to appease the Jews by saying it was the same angel yeah. that came to you guys. Yeah, remember, they only claimed to have an Abrahamic lineage after the Jews laughed at him and rejected him. Only then. Okay, so I'm going to mention one. This is, we're going to briefly step out to the Shia, right? So the Gnostics held that the physical world had been created by an inferior deity, right? Which is Yahweh. So remember, Yahweh is the evil god, Satan, right, of the Old Testament, who was allowed a certain latitude until God decided to send his son to inhabit the body of Jesus and free the world from the false teachings of Yahweh, God being the monad here, the Gnostic monad. Certain Gnostic notions passed into Islam when Muhammad adopted the Gnostic idea that the body which was crucified was only a phantom, which the Jews and Romans could not harm. This is in the book by Edward Berman called The Assassins, The Holy Killers of Islam. Now, this is a very common set of Gnostic ideas. If you read the scholars of Islam on the crucifixion, and I have, I have discussed that in my, 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 my series, the two shows I have called um, Paulemics, okay, on Islam's view of Paul, right, where they got the history of the Islamic polemic against Paul, you'll find that when they discuss the crucifixion, right, I found at least seven or eight different conflicting views. So the Islamic scholars, you, they'll tell you, well, Jesus wasn't on the cross. Ask them who was. Who, ask, just ask them who was on the cross. So tell me. They won't be able to answer you because they have no idea. Understand? Because the scholars in Islam cannot, cannot come to a conclusion. Well, at all. They, they all conflict with each other. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because what, you, what you're mentioning there is no matter what um, form of, or brand or um, designation of Christianity um, you follow. Jesus lived, Jesus was executed, Jesus was erected. There isn't really any difference between that. You might argue doctors would, uh, argue doctrines with these organizations, but that is one constant feature. Whereas with Muslims, uh, on just this historical point alone, there is no consistent answer. Yet the irony is, is when you look at the ayah in the Quran that talks about they follow a conjecture and they don't follow the conjecture to a certainty, it is the Muslims that are full of doubt. It is the Muslims that are full of conjecture. Christianity is one story. One exactly. story. The Gnostics have a dozen different stories, and so does Islam. Islam has all the Gnostic stories. Right? Now, to finish off here, there's a thing called allegoric, allegorical interpretation called Tawil, and we can look at that in Islamic law. You can go into the Encyclopedia of Islam and look it up as well. So the proselyte is taught that a prophet is known not by miracles. Oh, that's so convenient. So within Islamic law, the proselyte is taught that a prophet is not known by miracles, but by his ability to construct and impose a kind of system, a political system, that is political, social, religious, and philosophical. Isn't that convenient? Mm. How they've, re they've, they've reinterpreted this. No, 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 prophets aren't known by miracles. Understand? So when Christians are doing this ecumenical sort of interfaith dialogue with Muslims, they're wasting their time. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, go on. No, no, sorry, I was just in agreement with you. Okay, cool. So let's look at Ibn Khaldun, right? This is the most famous Islamic historian, right? The most famous Islamic historian. Thanks, XYZ. He's just posted the links to polemics. Uh, that, that's an interesting show. You'd like it. It's ridiculous. I mean, these guys thought that, um, for instance, like like one of the most famous scholars that, that Western, Western scholars love to quote, right? Um, Constantine is the son of Pontius Pilate. Now, Constantine is the guy who unbanned Christianity, Right. He did not make it state religion. He simply said, look, let's not kill the Christians anymore. Right. Now, Pontius Pilate lived at the time of Jesus and Constantine lived in what the third century. So you're looking at three, four hundred year gap. Right. And Constantine was the son of Pontius Pilate. Jesus. Oh, my God. The stories they tell. Paul is confused with King Saul. They, they thought Paul was King Saul. So they said that basically Paul uh, and this is 500 years prior. Right. So Paul basically left his throne as the king of the Jews. And, the, and the, the rabbis bribed him to to become a Christian and to become a fake Christian. Oh, God. It's a joke. It's a complete joke. The, if you read the actual, go through the books of these old scholars that they teach the polemic against Paul, it's a complete and utter joke. So, all right. So, Quran 6.18, Allah is a forceful subjugator. So, let's look at where they get this Quranic idea, right, which has become the Sharia, which is the deen, right? 
Uh, Seraph, yes, the confusion of basic fact is amazing. It's ridiculously funny once you... Seriously. Uh, so, notice in Quran 6.18, Allah is the subjugator over his servants. He doesn't love his servants. He, abju sub he subjugates them. Yeah, it's King Paul. Believe it. Believe it. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's just a joke what these guys believed. Ibn Khaldun, in the Muqaddimah, he says, Allah exercises forceful domination over his servants. Right? It should be known that after the removal of its prophet, a religious group must have someone to take care of it to cause the people to act according to the religious laws that he urges and the obligations imposed upon them. Okay, imposed upon them. The human species must have a person who will cause them to act in accordance with what is good for them. And oh, these Imams, they know what's good for you. And who will prevent them by force from doing things harmful to them? Oh, don't do that. We know better. This is good for you. You know, drink the camel stuff. Such a person is the one who is called ruler. In the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam, either by persuasion or by force. Caliphate and royal authority are united in Islam, no separation of church and state, so that the person in charge can devote the available strength to both of them. The other religious groups did not have a universal mission, and they admit this, and this is written after after the Crusades, right? So the other religious groups did not have a universal mission and the Holy War was not a religious duty to them, except only for the purposes of defense against the Muslims, of course. So the person in charge of religious affairs in other religious groups is not concerned with power politics. Among them, royal authority comes to those who have it by accident and in some way that has nothing to do with religion, not because they are under obligation to gain power over other nations as is the case with Islam, which is under obligation to gain power over they, other nations. They are merely so required they, to establish they, they, their religion among their own people. Yes, Thunderous. They saw it as an open target then. What you're basically saying is that the, the Islamic religion was smart enough to perceive that uh, other nations were an open target because if you look at, say, um, Christianity, it, the, Jesus made it clear, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things were too. So it's a personal relationship with God that you have there. It is, And um, if you look at the other scriptures, Matthew 24, 14, 20, 19, 20, it's talking about teaching people about putting the kingdom first. And the actual kingdom itself is Daniel 2, 44, which is what is waiting to be installed on earth. They is a personal relationship with God, not about setting up a kingdom like a, a Christian faith system on earth by way of a government. So they just saw this, the Islamic faith uh, system saw that as an open target. Right. Agreed. Yeah, that, that makes good sense. <clears throat> right. So, okay, hold on. So, okay. Yeah. So guys, I'm going to do one more page, then we'll call it a day because because Thunderous has a, um, a football match and football is very important. <laughs> and um, yeah, we wanted to keep it short and concise because, you know, when I do a two hour video, people complain it's too long. When I do a 20 minute video, it's like, Lloyd, it's too short. You really should fill out more. I, guys, I don't know what to do here. So I'm going to do 45 minutes today. All right. We're um, in the Goldilocks zone. So. Yeah. So, right. The sources of the law. So let's look at the sources of Islamic law. So there are two main source categories for discovering the law. They are the revealed rulings or so the revealed um, revelations right the revelations that are directly or the laws that are explicit in the Quran and Hadith things that are explicitly stated right which don't have to be inferred or logically deduced right so you've got the Quran and the Hadith okay Quran and Sunnah which the Sunnah means Hadith plus the Sirah the biographies of Muhammad effectively the Gospels of Mo right now they are practical so the root sources are the Quran and Sunnah but they are incomplete they're not thorough enough the practical sources are the Ijma, which is the consensus of the founding scholars of the four yeah. schools. Right. It's echoing. Okay, I don't know why. Right. Um, let me just do something. Thunderous, can you say something, please? Okay. Can you still hear Thunderous, guys? Are you still able to hear Thunderous? Okay. So... Okay, so guys, just drop a one if you can hear Thunderous. No, okay, it looks like I've disabled your audio, Thunderous. Okay, fine, We're, Thunderous is back now. Okay, so practical sources, Ijma, which is the consensus of the founding scholars. In other words, the consensus, the, the mutual opinion. Thunderous, say something, please. Hi, everybody, can you hear me now? Okay, they should, yeah. So the consensus, the in other words, the opinions of the four scholars who founded the schools of Fiqh, right? 
those scholars, their opinion of what the Quran means, their opinion of what the Hadiths mean, that is the final opinion on Islam. That is the ijma. It overrules the Quran. It overrules the Hadiths. Understand? Okay, can I, yeah? can I ask a question on that? Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, what was on my mind? Um, how many years after Muhammad, after, okay, how many years after the third generation is this taking place? So this starts in 850, but it kind of doesn't really take root, but it's among the Umayyad and then the Abbasids in the 950s, nine, the, the middle of the night of the 10th century, the okay. 950s, they really go ape. Uh, I will How cover that. I will go into detail. Actually, later on in this in the series, I will go into great detail. We'll actually cover all that step by step. Okay. But you're looking at middle of the 10th century up until the beginning of the 12th. So say from 950 to about 1115 in that region is where most of this is going on. So this is two. This is like 300, 200, 300 years after Muhammad's death. Okay. If he died in 632, then this is only, then this is basically 270 years after his death that this goes on. That this but, starts, if the first, but if the first three generations of Islam were the purest and the best, why are the why are we getting the purest or law of Islam 500 years later, and most of it is taken without the use of the Quran and the Sunnah? Well, yeah, those are questions we all will have to deal with. Uh, Jesse Wales. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse Wells. Yeah. So so then there are a couple of other things. Ijtihad, independent reasoning, which you're not allowed to do, really, because the scholars have done it for you. Just shut up and listen. And the kias, which is basically legal analogy, legal comparison. Is there something similar that we can make a comparison to as opposed to extrapolating, you know, inducing something from something else, deducing? And ijma will end on this. In law, it is the third, but in practice, it is the most important of the sources of legal knowledge. This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam. It is the unanimous agreement of the community. And when they say community, they don't mean lay Muslims. They mean the scholars, the scholarly community, the imams, on a regulation imposed by Allah. Okay? It is the unanimous doctrine and opinion of the recognized religious authorities. Now, notice when they say at any given time, understand a lot of the Encyclopedia of Islam is written by Islamic apologists. Okay? And they will put these funny things in. When they say any given time, they mean at a specific period in history. This will be that 9th century to 12th century period. All right. So I think... So, oh, by the way, ijtihad mutlak. In law, it is the creative act of reasoning. This is personal reasoning, right? This is saying, okay, well, this happened in the Quran, and what do we do now in this new situation, right? This is how you think through... Okay, through which the founding imams derived from the revealed sources a systematic structure of law. Ijtihad mutlak. Mutlak means absolute. So these scholars became what is known as mujtahids mutlak. So they became absolute mujtahids, absolute scholars. They have absolute knowledge of Islam. They're not like lay Muslims. These are very special men because their knowledge is absolute, perfect. Cannot be questioned, cannot be wrong. As opposed to restricted. Okay, so they are the mujtahids mutlak. Right, so I'll end here. We'll call it a night. And um, thank you, guys. Um, some really good comments. And uh, hopefully I've answered all the questions. Okay. And uh, Th Thunderous, uh, any last words from you? Yeah, I, th I think Bob Fisher, um, Bob Fisher kind of got there before I did. It says He says, um, 1,400 years of refinery and yet still makes no sense. And that's the point. We're, we're over 1,000 years away from um, Muhammad and they still can't refine it. Even, even in the countries today, it, it, the Islamic world today is a very demonstration of how impossible this Sharia law is, yet they claim it's per the perfect law for mankind. Of course they do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So look, um, all the questions. So Thunder, should we do a show on Sunday evening, perhaps? Yes, I'm up for a show on Sunday I evening. I know I'm supposed to do a show with Thaddeus as well, but maybe we should do one together. Um, but yeah, so look, let me talk to Thaddeus. Uh, but otherwise, we should do it. We can continue on Sunday. So guys, yeah, uh, we've had a death in the family, so I need to go away. Uh, we need to go and deal with that. And But I'll be back on Sunday, so I should be free Sunday evening. Around the same time, we can do an hour. And uh, thanks, guys. I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Bob from Australia. That's a long way to that's a long way to come to the show, but thank you, um, Kagito, Sergeant Grinch, Seraph. Um, thank you all very much for being here again, and I do appreciate the the contributions, guys. It's really appreciated. And yeah, so uh, guys, I'll see you on Sunday. I'll try and focus more on my channel again tomorrow night with Nuria Khan and Thunderous. You have a you have a football match to go and watch. 
I do. I just want to say goodbye to everybody. It's been it's been nice for you to invite me back on your show, um, Lloyd, and I appreciate that. And there's been some really good, positive, encouraging comments um, t tonight. And I just want to say a, a big thank you to everybody. A big, big up to everybody. Thank you for your nice comments. I very much appreciate it. Yeah. No. Thank you. So thanks again, so guys. Um, yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you for the sympathies, guys. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, well, you know. Um, yeah, these things happen. So, and oddly enough, uh, the funeral's not going to be on my uh, on the same day. I was going to have my birthday party. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to be a different kind of uh, event. Okay, guys. So, take take care. We'll see you guys soon. Okay. Look out for us on Sunday and tomorrow night on Nuria Khan's channel, Holy Humanist. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye bye.